Hey everyone, I'm Kevin Wallace from Redemption to the Nation's Church, and I'm grateful that we are going to have this opportunity to bring this message of hope, healing, and restoration to you and your family today. I want you to stay with me till the end. I'm going to come back and pray. Be blessed by the word of the Lord. Stand with me for the word. Go right to Luke 19, and I'll I'll expedite the message today. Luke 19, 11. How many are thankful for the kingdom of God? How many want to be a part of the kingdom? Well, I hope you want to be part of the kingdom because I'm grateful for the church, but this church is not the sum total of what Jesus came for. He came to establish the kingdom. And how many know you have a purpose in the kingdom of God? Luke chapter 19, verse 11, and today I want to preach a message called Understanding the Kingdom. I may talk about this for a couple of weeks. We're in a series called Thy Kingdom Come. But today I want to talk about understanding the kingdom of God, and I want to teach from Luke's Gospel, the 19th chapter, the 11th verse, and it reads this way. Now, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. That's a very important phrase. They thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And so he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 minas, and said to them, do business. If you have a King James Bible, what does it say? It says, occupy till I come. Do business till I come. The New American Standard Version says, do business with this until I come. Mm. But his citizens hated him. And they sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came first the saying, Master, your mina has earned 10 minas. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you were faithful and very little have authority over 10 cities. And the second came saying, Master, you ha- your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, you, are also, you will also be over five cities. And then another came saying, Master, here's your mina. Now look at the disrespect of this last servant. Here's your mina, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief, for I feared you, because you are an Oster man. You collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, out of your own mouth, I will judge you. Wicked ser- you wicked servant, you knew that I was an Ulster man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping where I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank that at my coming I might have collected it with interests? And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to him who has ten minas. But they said to him, Master, he has ten minas. For I say to you that to everyone who has will be given, and from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. I mean, that's a heavy word. In fact, nobody wants to say amen on that word. But the reality of it is, Sometimes we present Jesus as this meek little lamb who holds hands with everybody and wants them all to sing Kumbaya. The day is coming when those who have rejected the Son will experience the wrath of God. And I'm here today to report to you that the gospel is good news, and the good news is if you've said no to Jesus a hundred times, today is the day that you can make a U-turn in life and kiss the son in love and intimacy and fall in love with Jesus and every ounce of the wrath of God that we would have experienced in our future can be removed from our future because of grace and mercy. How many are thankful for the grace and mercy of God? Say amen. I wanna preach today about understanding the kingdom of God. Father, help us today, I pray in Jesus' name. Lord, give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. I've asked you, Lord, for the ability to teach the kingdom in a way that people can begin to grab it, not just understand it, but enter the kingdom. 
Too many people on the outside of kingdom living and kingdom life in this day. And I pray in the name of the Lord that online and in the house we would have an encounter with God. Our eyes would be open. Spirit of revelation, come now we pray in Jesus' name. And we give you thanks for it in advance. And everyone said amen. Come on, let's give God one more praise in the house this morning. Hallelujah. So last week we learned about the covenant kingdom. How many remember the message from last week? And we talked about the disciples who had continued. The Bible said they continued with Jesus through the trial, just before his crucifixion, just before his betrayal by Judas. Jesus gathers his 12 in an upper room. He tells them he desires to eat this Passover meal with them. And after they have this amazing time together, Luke 22 teaches us that Jesus looked at them and said, just as the Father bestowed the kingdom upon me, I am going to the bestow the kingdom upon you. And that word bestow is covenantal language. It's language that, 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 only, um, that only occurs between two people who are walking in covenant together. The kingdom is not given to people who are happy on the crust of Christianity. The kingdom is revealed to people who have the heart of God and at the core of their being, they want to live seeking the kingdom of God first. Jesus said in Matthew 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything you need in life will be added to you. I want to tell you today, if there is any other ambition or goal, if there's any other mark for which you have set your life and your living, you need to come into alignment with the purpose of God for your life today and make sure that you are seeking first the kingdom of God. I want to tell you today that you don't need to seek first a career. You don't need to seek first a spouse. You don't need to seek first more money. You don't need to seek first a, a, a higher way of knowledge. What you need to seek first is the kingdom of God and the righteousness of Jesus in your life. And if you seek that first and that becomes the goal of your life, I want to tell you God has a way of adding to you everything that you are looking for on the inside. Seek you first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you means this, that when you get the kingdom, the kingdom unlocks everything you need and releases it back into your life. How many can, have, can testify today that since God has woken up in you this kingdom thing, that it's opened doors you could have never imagined and made connections you could have never made and given you opportunities? Come on, some of us, we look a whole lot better. We have fooled a whole lot of y'all. Because we're not as smart as it looks like we are. We're only recipients of kingdom blessing and kingdom provision. And because we've said no to other things and yes to the kingdom, God has added stuff into your life that doesn't even make sense. Anybody living a life you don't deserve? And so we talked about covenant kingdom last week and he bestows this kingdom through the, to those who have a relationship with them. And, and today, what I felt like God was wanting me to bear down on is to help us begin to understand what I'm talking about when I say the kingdom of God, living in the kingdom of God. Because you, if you're not careful, you can preach messages like this and people can hear it and say, what's the big deal? I mean, we're in church. Isn't that good enough? Listen, I'm thankful you're here and I'm thankful that you're watching online family, but it's really important that you understand there is something far greater connected to your life than just being a part of a church. There, there is something called kingdom living that you and I are to tap into. And, and I want us to begin to, 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 to put some understanding and some verbiage to when I, have you ever heard somebody say they're kingdom minded? 
You ever heard that phrase before? They're kingdom minded. What does that mean when we say a person is kingdom minded? What does it mean when we say that we are seeking first the kingdom of God? We are a kingdom church. We're a kingdom people. We don't just believe that God's doing something in these four walls. We believe the Lord is an international God who is doing something on every continent, in every country, in tribes and villages. Come on, in hamlets and cities, in states and provinces, in Muslim countries, in Christian countries, in other religions. Religions, it, it, wherever people are, God is breaking through, showing them a revelation of his kingdom. Jesus did not come just to start another social club. Jesus came to establish his kingdom on this earth. And what we're trying to teach over the next few weeks is entry into kingdom living. I want you to live a kingdom life and I want you to have a kingdom mind. And you cannot be religious and kingdom at the same time time and so we're going to talk about kingdom understanding the kingdom and the first thing I, I want to talk about as it regards to understanding the kingdom I want to dispel two erroneous notions that are the extremities of kingdom teaching and whenever people teach the kingdom if you're not careful you will hear one of these two extremes and both of them are equally wrong number one well first of all let's establish this both of these erroneous ideas about the kingdom have to do with the timing of the kingdom. Everybody who trips over the kingdom message trips over it because they do not understand the timing of the kingdom of God. I've taught this to you a, a number of times when I taught the kingdom, but it's very important that you get this. The kingdom is an already not yet kingdom. If you don't get that the kingdom is an already not yet kingdom, you will either live trying to activate things prematurely like the disciples did, or you will live thinking that you have no responsibility now simply except to wait on him to return. Both of those things, that one day in the far off future, the kingdom will come, or we got to do it right now, and it's going to happen now. And if it's not happening now, it's never going to happen. Both of those th ideas are completely off. In fact, that's where we get this entire parable that I'm teaching this morning. The Bible said that Jesus had to teach a parable because the disciples were under the misguided understanding that he was going to Jerusalem to establish the kingdom at that moment. And because, read the text, because they thought he was going to do it in that moment, he had to give them a parable to slow them down and help them understand that the kingdom of God can be here, but not in full manifestation yet. This is why we call it an already not yet kingdom of God, because it's going to come in fullness in the future, but it's already been planted in seed form now. And the people who think that it has to happen now live disappointed when they don't see the kingdom in politics, the kingdom in the financial sector. When we look in our world and see all the darkness, we think, where is God? God is here. The kingdom is picking up steam. And the people who think the kingdom of God is a million years away, they also live discouraged because they think we don't have anything to do except, except sit here and die and wait on Jesus to come to establish his kingdom. Can I tell you, Jesus is going to come and establish the kingdom in fullness. When? We don't know. So what do we do while we wait? We do kingdom business till the king returns. Some people want to sit, soak, and sour complain and murmur and woe is us and the world is going to hell in a handbasket and Jesus is going to come bail us out real soon. I want to tell you that is not the idea Jesus had when he left planet earth. When he left this planet, he did not look at his disciples and say survive. He looked at his disciples and said, occupy until, y'all better help me today. I've come to tell you that the church does not have the privilege of watching this world go to hell in a handbasket and just come to 
church on Sunday and feel like survivors on an island who are barely going to make it. We have been given the authority of the king to do business on behalf of the king and for the advancing of the kingdom of God. So it's already happening. And yet I'm fully aware that it's not happening in its fullness yet. Ready? And it will not happen in its fullness till the king returns. There are people who teach, we don't need Jesus to return, we got this. Y'all crazy. We need Jesus to return to establish the fullness of the kingdom. But we don't wait on him to return until we start doing kingdom business. We actually, man, I feel like I am plowing through some mindsets. And this is a good thing. I'm not complaining. I'm telling you that while I'm teaching, I'm watching light bulbs go off. Because I feel like far too long, religion has raised a bunch of sons and daughters who come to the church and don't think they have an eternal purpose. I want to tell you that when you came into the kingdom of God, you stepped into your purpose. Your purpose has never been, Jesus help me here, your purpose has never been to warm a pew and wait on the king to come and rescue you. Your purpose is to find out what the king gave you and then understand it came from him to glorify him and to advance his purpose in the earth. So the timing of the kingdom, please understand we are already in it. We're already living in the kingdom but the kingdom has not fully manifested yet. So what do we do with the in-between? Glad you ask. <laughs> Jesus teaches this parable and he wants us to see that he gives us gifts, abilities before he leaves and the first step Taking notes, write this down. I'm just teaching today. The first step, step to understanding kingdom life is to recognize that what you have came from God. Now that seems rather elementary and simplistic, but you would be amazed at how many people come to church and either feel like they earned their way into the place they're in or that they don't have anything useful to help the kingdom of God advance. I wanna tell you, not one person, that's a loaded statement, because there's over a thousand people in this room right now, not one person in this room can seriously say, God gave me nothing. Every person in this room have different gifts, different abilities, different financial situations, different jobs, different callings, different different. That's why Paul says in the book of Romans chapter 12 that God gave us a metron. How many remember that series from about five years ago? The metron. God gives a measure, listen, God gives a measure to every person in this room. That's why you do not need to get bent out of shape when you encounter somebody that you can see the measure of God on them and you say, it's not fair. They got more than I got. They got more, but you got something. I didn't get no help on that. They got more, but thank God you have something. And what you have may not be as much as your neighbor, but lose your spirit of offense. Quit being envious and jealous and take an inventory of what you have and say, you know what? I don't have as much as they have, but little is much when God is in what I got. Hey, anybody thankful that God is willing to get into what little you got? And when God gets into what little you got, little becomes much when God is in it. Let me just step on the spirit of jealousy and envy. Stop coveting what other people have and stop creating lies on them because they have more than you. You do not know what they went through or the hell and the price they paid for it. And if you saw the sleepless nights, you probably wouldn't covet what they got. And that was free.
So Jesus in this text gives them a purpose. And, that, and he gives each of them 10 minus. Now here's the thing about it. All of them got 10 minus. But each of them did something different with what they had. And the multiplication of each servant was at a different level. I want to tell you, you're called to be a multiplier. I'm going to preach till the spirit of lack comes off of somebody's mind today. And I'm not just talking about lacking money. I'm talking about lack. Lack is not just about money. Honey, honey, if you've got a spirit of lack on you, you feel like you're deficient in every area. You're not smart enough. You're not tall enough. You're not handsome enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not connected enough. You're not educated enough. You're not rich enough. That is the voice of lack. And it haunts you and harasses you and wants you to believe you don't have what it takes and you'll never amount and you'll never overcome and that's just your lot in life. And I came to find that devil and to grab it by the nap of the neck and to tell you in the name of the Lord that you were not created for lack. You were not created to barely make it across the finish line. You are more than a conqueror. You are not just a conqueror. You are more than a conqueror. And it's time to put on a game face and to tell the devil, greater is he that is in me than the one that's living in this world. I'm not just a stepchild. I'm a son of Yahweh. I'm a daughter of the Most High God. I feel the kingdom getting ready to break out in here. How many know if God be for you, it don't matter who's against you. You have a purpose. Fix this, Chris. Stuck on page one and I need page three by now. You have a purpose. And if he can't find it, I'll preach without it, hallelujah. You have a purpose, ready for this? And your purpose is first and foremost connected to you being aware that what you have, the 10 I got came from God. The 10 I got came from God. Thank you. And my 10 don't have to be as shiny as your 10. But if I'm going to live a kingdom life, I've got to recognize that what I have, God gave me. And if you don't recognize that, you have ceased to live in a kingdom revelation. Ready for this? When you've got a kingdom mind, then you look at the 10 you got and say, let's get to work. That's all I got. I don't have 12, I don't have 20, I got these 10. And I'm gonna work with what I got. Come on in here, y'all. How many learned how to work with what you got? Sometimes you gotta do that in every facet of your life. You gotta learn how to work with what you have. And you can't sit down your whole life and complain about what God gave somebody else that he didn't give you. Whatever you have came from God. Well, not really, not really, Bishop, because I, I inherited it. My family gave it. No, see, if you got a kingdom mind, then you see those parents who left you an inheritance as a resource rather than a source. Well, Bishop, I, I'm, I'm educated. That's how I got what I got. Well, if you're a kingdom-minded person, you recognize it was God that gave you the scholarship and God that helped you pass the ACT and God that helped you get your foot in the door. And you know you ain't smart enough to be a doctor all by yourself, but it was God that gave so I'm trying to get you to shift your thinking from yourself to the king who gave you everything you need to fulfill everything
thing he called you to do. So there are three servants. I don't want to make you mad at me because I love you. But in every room, there are people who are willing to multiply by 10, some who multiply by five, some who don't multiply at all. I hope you become today in your mind a multiplier of kingdom resources. Let me talk about that for a moment. When I say he gave them 10 minus, first of all, I read a bunch of commentary this week. It's amazing how many people go to great lengths to try to prove that he's not talking about money. He's not talking about money. He's talking about influence. Well, that's great. If you believe that, that's wonderful because I, I think we can go there, but, but he is talking about money. <laughs> See, we get quiet right here. We get quiet right here because money is none of your business, Bishop. It is not mine. You're absolutely right. I don't care what you got. But Jesus does. You mean he knows? Oh, not only does he know, he gave it to you. Which is why I don't understand when Pastor Quantel says we believe in tithing. People start going, Ugh. Do you know the Bible said when the woman gave two mites and the Pharisees come up and gave the tithe? Do you know what the Bible said? Jesus was standing at the altar looking at what they gave. I ain't got no help in here, so let me walk around. If I'm going to make you mad, at least let me get close to you. Hallelujah. I want you to know Jesus cares what you have, and he cares what you do with what he gave you. Well, you're a tither because you're a pastor, and if people don't tithe, you don't have a job. I want to help everybody understand something. You didn't call me. I want you to understand I'm bound to this. I don't have a choice. If money don't come in next week, I'm still going to get up and preach because preaching is not something I do for money. Preaching is what I do because I'm called. And when I had a polyester suit, a blue one that I ironed and the lapels got shiny because it was made out of polyester. When I didn't have a two dimes to rub together, I preached like my head was on fire because the call of God and the anointing are not for sale. Somebody got to hear me. I'm trying to break something over some of you that has been in your family for a hundred years. You are going to break the back of poverty off your life by understanding the covenant blessing of Yahweh. You know what? I was 17 years old. My mama's sitting here, she'll tell you this. I was 17 years old when I heard my first message on tithing. I was preaching at 18. I would call my mama from wherever I was preaching and I would say, send in the tithe check. She said, what's the tithe? I said, 10%. See, my whole family was raised in church. We never heard a series on tithing. You know what we said when it was off? Some of y'all getting ready to get your bags and leave. We love you, see you Wednesday. I ain't changing for you. You wanna stay disgusted and broken? You go right ahead. I'm preaching to somebody who's tired of living like a slave in your mind and you want to step into something greater than you've ever stepped into before. That's who I'm talking to. I was 17 years old. I text my mama. I said, write the tithe check, take it to church. She said, Kevin Wallace, you can't afford to send that in. I said, mama, I can't afford not to. 
I want you to know I have I have been poor I have been broke I have had nothing I have seen people in need and wanted to help them but not have the ability to help them and I want to tell you that today when I see somebody in need if the Lord blesses my house he understands that I found a son who will be generous and help those who are I'm talking to y'all today God doesn't just want to get more to you so you can drive in a bigger car he wants the kingdom to be demonstrated through sons and daughters who know how to take what God gave them and multiply I'm gonna freak you out this week not multiplying is not even a choice Well, you know, this is just one of those, this is just one of those optional things he's talking about. He's so excited. <laughs> there is no place in the Bible. Well, you know, he's up there talking about law. He needs to get over in the New Testament, get in that grace. Let me tell you this, sister, yay, yay. There is no place in your Bible that permits a stingy Christian. No place. And we, we take this thing about tithing and we say, we throw up, that's the law. And you know what people use that for? They use it to permit stinginess and their heart has no generosity at all. I want you to understand something. Tithing is not where I stopped. It's where I launched from. I'm thankful today that God has enabled me to be more than a tither. Some of y'all are like, are you through with this yet? Almost. God invites you. He doesn't make you. He doesn't. He doesn't make you. He invites you in to a place of multiplication. And this is about everything. Not just money, but it includes money. It includes gifts. What are you good at? God gave you that. What are you passionate about? God gave you that. What do you like doing? What is it you feel assigned to? Well, you know what? I never had time to think about it. I got this job. What if that job is more than a job? What if it's an assignment? I fear you're not catching what I'm throwing out today. I want you to begin to see your life not as simply an employee of a boss that strokes a check and signs his name and you think that he's your source. I want you to begin to see yourself as a son and daughter of Yahweh who God has already made a way for and God is able to provide and bless you and multiply you even if your boss who you thought was your source begins to hate you and doesn't want you to be a part of his, his company anymore. God has a way of being your source and when man shuts one door, a multiplier is not in a mess. A multiplier sees a shut door as an opportunity for God to open another door because I'm not the cursed. I'm the blessed of God in the city, in the field, when I come, when I go. So, so he gives them all 10. Ready for this? This is the kingdom. And the king leaves. He puts 10 minas in each of their hands and he leaves. And he says before he leaves, I'm coming back. When I come back, I'm bringing the kingdom with me. While I'm gone, occupy. The word occupy or do business in the Greek 
is pragmatuamai. I stayed up till 1 a.m. practicing that. It's a true story. I was walking around, my kids thought I was speaking in tongues. Pragmatuamai. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. Pragmatuamai. It's only used one time in the entire New Testament. This is the one place this verb is used. And the prefix of the Greek word pragmatuamai is pragma, P-R-A-G-M-A, where you would see the word pragmatic to work out, to be about the business of. Pragmatic people are not lazy people. I'm getting ready to make some enemies. Y'all take a big deep breath and don't scream and cuss, but listen to me. God is not a socialist. You feel that wave? Where is he going? I'm coming. I am coming. God is not a socialist. He starts out by giving all three of them 10. But when he returns, he takes inventory. Who was good at multiplying? So the first guy comes up and says, you gave me 10, I, I got 10 more. And what does he say? Well done. You were faithful over a little. Now you're gonna be ruler over 10 cities. Do you understand? Know this is crazy. He essentially gives him 10 cents. The dude gives him 20 cents back. And Jesus said, you know what to do with it. Now I'm gonna put you over 10 cities. I made a dime, two dimes, and you're gonna put me over 10 cities? Yes, because if you can make a dime turn into two dimes, you can take 10 cities and steward them well. I'm weeding it out while I preach this message today. The, the, man with, the man with 10 comes back. The second one said, I, got, I had 10, I got five more, 15. Jesus said, good. You multiplied from 10 and made it 15. Now you're going to rule over five cities. Do you understand that what little you have right now is preparing you for the greatness God has for you in the millennium? When you wake up in the morning and you don't think about being a good steward of where you are right now, you are literally disqualifying yourself from ruling in greatness with Christ in the future. Stop it. We need to have some godly pride, not bad pride, godly pride in fulfilling the assignment God put on our lives. You know those people? We got so many of them here. How many are thankful for all the people in our parking lot, in our children's department? Come on, all the lobby at greeters, all the people. Do you know that there are people who just put up with my preaching? They just endure me so that they can get a handshake and a smile when they come through the door because they love the people who take their job for the kingdom in this house seriously. That's the spirit of excellence on us. Oh, you better let me preach to you today. We're not some ragtag bunch of nobodies that are going nowhere. People are flying in from all over the world just to come to a Sunday morning service. And we're getting up out the bed at 1030, getting in here late, talking about, well, it's a little bit dark in here, a little bit cold in here, a little too loud in here. Put your smile on. Jerk yourself up. We have an assignment. This is not about me or you. This is about the kingdom of God. My Lord will argue over the color of the wall when we get to heaven. But not this morning. We've got a job to do and we better get to it. Well, we got all these kids coming. I heard this two weeks ago. Got all these kids coming. We need some more workers. Well, what's wrong with you? I'm making some enemies. I'm telling the truth this morning. Drop three kids off and we can't get one hour out of you a month to serve in the... Well, pastor, you on a mission today. I'm just telling you, we're not thinking like kingdom people sometimes. 
We're called to multiply. And here's the thing, you're gifted to do it. Some of you. <laughs> Let me help you. Have you ever seen somebody who wanted to cook in the kitchen but didn't know how to cook? <laughs> Lord, help me here. I'm getting all in this dangerous territory. <laughs> Listen, let me help you understand something. If you can't cook, find out what you can do and go do that. Have you ever met somebody who really wanted to sing with a microphone in their hand? It's not that they didn't want to sing. They, they wouldn't sing in the choir because that wasn't enough spotlight. I'm plowing. Woo, I'm like Noxema. I'm coming up under foundation today. No, it wasn't that they wanted to sing. It's that they wanted everybody to hear them sing and what nobody had the courage to tell you in your family is that you could not hold a note if you had a handle on it. But the problem is you spending all your life trying to do something that you really want to do instead of finding out what God gifted you to do. And what we all need is for people to come into their purpose and understand that the 10 they have is what they need. We'll finish this this next week. But let me tell you this before we close today. The king is coming back. And he's going to say, what did you do while I was gone? He is. Every single believer in this room will give an account for how they stewarded what he left them. And not multiplying it is not an option. And every time I come into a place in my life where I think, I entertain momentarily the thought, I'm just gonna chill. I'm gonna relax. I'm not gonna be so driven. God reminds me that stewardship is not an option. That multiplying is not just a choice, it's a responsibility. When we took this building in 2013, it did not look like this. Amen. The property, <laughs> I always got them people. I always got them people. I love them people. You up here preaching your guts out, making people mad, they all leave it on you. Amen, glory to God. <laughs> I love it. It didn't look like this. It didn't have this many seats. It could seat about 1,100 people. How many were here for that first Sunday? There was a handful of y'all in here that first Sunday. We were jam-packed. There were walls right over there and right over there, those wings out there and the, where that curtain is. None of those seats were there. And I remember feeling like it was so big then. Play something, Julian, or somebody. Say, somebody play something. I'll land this thing. I, I remember thinking, this is so big. And I remember God speaking to me and saying, it can't hold what I want to do. If we would have just got in the building and said, we're in the building, gold walls, y'all don't remember this, nasty gold, maroon pews, a choir loft big enough to herd cattle. I mean, it was, it, and what's the point of this story? The point of this story is we began to work with what we had and advance the kingdom and give it all we had and it started multiplying. We, we, we had the opportunity supernaturally to acquire the Tennessee Tem Temple University campus. And everybody said, what are you gonna do, what are you gonna do, what are you gonna do? You got 16 buildings and they're all falling apart. What are you gonna do? I said, Good. first of all, get out of my face, chill out. This is a marathon, not a sprint. But here we are nine years later and we're getting ready to have a chapel 
completely renovated and we're almost done with the youth and new generations building right behind us and the devil thought he would burn down two buildings but we're going to build something back that make the devil wish he would have never messed with us in the first place that's right why because when you got a kid you when you got a kingdom mind you don't ever receive a blessing and see it as a finish line you keep thinking oh he did that wonder what he could do if we just stay open before him and keep letting a spirit of kingdom multiplication work through our lives why y'all gotta go to Cleveland because the kingdom's calling us why we got a church in Uruguay? Why we got a church in Guatemala? Why we got a church in Bulgaria? Why we gonna have other campuses? Because the kingdom is calling. Well, why can't we just sit here and be happy? Because that ain't the way the kingdom operates. Stand with me. I want to tell somebody in this room right now who has felt like a season of pause feels like stuff has just stopped happening. Things have stopped clicking, doors have stopped opening, and you're wondering, what's going on? I want you to evaluate something. Has the pause come because you've lost your kingdom thrust and you've entered into maintenance mode rather than advancing mode? You've entered into maintenance, yes, thank you, Holy Spirit. You've entered into maintenance mode rather than multiplication mode. Somebody give me a, a prayer cloth or something, a, 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 a drop cloth. We throw on people that fall out with short dresses, something. Somebody give me a dollar or a, 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 a hundred or something. I give it back. Okay, okay. Thank you, man of God. Man, you gave me. Okay, what is that? Is that all? Praise God. That's an offering. Okay, watch. I'm just kidding. Watch, I'm just kidding. Watch, watch, watch. God gives you what you have. And he says, do business till I come. Till I come, because I'm coming back. And while I'm gone, I want you to take what you got that I gave you, trade with it. It's what the word literally means, trade with it. Do business, work with what I gave you, because I'm coming back. That's not a threat, it's an invitation into multiplication. In other words, the king's coming back and cannot wait to see, with that, to see what you did with what he gave you. So he gives it to you. Gifts, time, talent, treasure. He puts all those things in your hand. And in the hand of a multiplier, God breathes blessing on it. And he takes the gift, the dreams, the abilities, the money, the resources, the job, the business, whatever it is God gave you and blessed you with, those who have that spirit of the kingdom on them, they multiply. And when he comes back, you give him more than he, than he left you with. And he says, well done, come on in. But there are people who take what the king gives them and they say, oh, he's coming back? I don't know. I don't know if I can make him happy. He's a tough guy. I'm going to fold this up. I'm going to fold this up. And I'm, all, I'm just going to sit it to the side. And when you put what he gave you in a handkerchief, you can't do business with it anymore. Well, I don't have as much as my neighbor. You don't need as much as your neighbor. You just need to do with what you have, with what God called you to do. And so the king comes back and he says to the third servant, what you got? He goes, here's, here's what you left me. And the Bible says the king looked at him and called him wicked. And he says the most unbelievable phrase in the Bible. Take what he has from him and give it to the one who multiplied it and made it ten. Well, that ain't fair, because God ain't fair. God is just. You say God is not fair, and what you mean by that is God is not treating me 
or treating someone else equal as he is other people. God reserves the right to make sure his resources are put in the hands of people who know what to do with them. So there are two groups of people I want to pray for today. People who are in a season where it feels like things have shut down. Doors have quit opening. You're out of rhythm. Nothing's working. Why? I think God sent me today to provoke somebody back to kingdom thinking. Out of a pattern of maintenance back into a pattern of multiplication. And number two, I want to talk to people, and I don't want anyone to make a move. I'm not at, I, I, want, I want you to stay in your seat. I want you to do this in the cover of where you are because I would never shame or embarrass anyone. I want to talk to people who are envious and jealous of other people in the kingdom of God. That season must come to an end for you if you will walk in the blessing of God. You will never walk in the increase of God while you resent the increase of God that he gave to someone else's life. So Father, I pray for a spirit of increase and multiplication to come upon the people. Lord, not just resources and money, but in their gifts, abilities, in their time, talent, and treasure. Teach us how to steward as kingdom citizens what it is you've blessed us with. We repent right now. I pray for anyone in this room that's under conviction because they've been jealous and envious of other people's multiplication. I pray that they would lose that now. Father, this, this is, this is a, a season where we should celebrate your blessing on other people's lives. When a door opens for them, we should not be jealous that that door did not open for us. We should celebrate the open door for our brother or sister. When the promotion happens for them in their job, we should not be jealous of that promotion. We should celebrate that promotion. We shouldn't live with envy in our hearts. So I'm praying for this house that in this moment, that anyone in this place who is making it difficult for your blessing to rest upon them because they continue to walk in ways that grieve your heart. I pray now, Lord, you'll just cleanse that and wash that away. Let us celebrate. Let us be a people who celebrate with our brother and sister who experience the blessing of God. And I pray today, God, for the person who is in that pause. If I'm talking to you and you just feel like life has sort of slowed down, it's pause. There's doors are not opening and some things have, you've lost your rhythm and you, and you need to get out of maintenance mode and back into multiplication mode. Lift your hand if I'm talking to you right now. I know it's not everybody, but if I'm talking to you, just lift your hand. Uh-huh. Yep. Hands up all over this house. Father, I pray right now for the men and women of God, the brothers and sisters in the kingdom of God who are lifting their hand right now saying that they feel like a, 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 they're out of rhythm, a pause has happened, the doors are not opening like they were, things are not happening like they were. I pray for the people that lifted their hand right now. I break off of them a maintenance mentality and I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit you would stir them to multiply again. Give them fresh vision. Come on pray people of God. Give them fresh vision. Give them fresh revelation. Give them fresh understanding. Give them fresh ideas. Speak to their renewed mind. Somebody buried something and quit on something that God's not through with yet and I pray for a resurrection of that thing to come to your life right now. I speak to the future. I speak to the future that you have in Christ to your purpose and I declare your purpose will never be fully discovered in maintenance mode. It will only be fully discovered while you have a heart to multiply the kingdom of God. Come on, grace is being released right now to begin to multiply again and I pray in the name of Jesus that people who felt like giving up entertain the thought of giving up, thought about just pushing pause in this season, I pray you would begin to activate in them today, God, a fresh grace for multiplication in Jesus' name. Now lift your hands all over this room right now and for about 30 seconds, let's begin to praise God for what he has given us and let's begin to commit afresh and anew. Come on, God, you gave it to us. You're the giver of every good and perfect gift. You're the one, come on, worship him. You're the one that put it in our hands and we will not sit through this life waiting on your return and we will not just watch, we will occupy, we will do business, we will succeed, we will be successful in all of it for the glory of God.
in Jesus' name. Now somebody lift up a shout and a praise all over the church. Come on. Come on, give him praise. Hallelujah. Friend, I believe God is a miracle working God and the greatest miracle that God could ever work in your life is the gift of salvation. And I believe today somebody's watching me who says, Pastor Kevin, would you pray for me? I wanna give my life to God. I wanna serve the Lord. I want Jesus to save me. Let's pray this prayer together today. Mean it in your heart. Say, dear God, I repent of my sins. I turn to you today, Lord Jesus, believing that you're the Son of God and that you died for my sins. Forgive me, Lord Jesus. Come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Listen, friend, if you prayed that prayer, I want you to go to kevinwallace.tv, and I just want you to drop us a prayer request and let us know that you gave your heart to Christ. Our team wanna pray for you. We wanna make sure that you're in a good, loving, Bible-believing church wherever you're from, and that you continue to grow in your walk with Jesus Christ best days of your life are still ahead of you. We're praying for you today. God bless and look forward to seeing you next week right here.